Hello, I'm Christina Davis, Director of the Program on US-Japan Relations at Harvard University. Good evening to and elsewhere. We're really excited to have a presentation on Japan's high-tech competitiveness in an era of US-China decoupling. We are proud to feature Professor Kazuyuki Motohashi, who is a professor at the University of Tokyo and a really widely cited scholar who has studied economics of technological innovation and a wide range of issues about how countries improve their productivity through innovation with a focus on small medium enterprises, entrepreneurship, and a range of policies. He is a visiting researcher at the National Institute for Science and Technology Policy. Amongst his wide experience, he has both been a scholar and a practitioner, including as an economist for the OECD. He has written papers in Research Policy, the Journal of Japanese International Economies, and several books, including, most recently, a book on global business strategy, multinationals venturing into emerging economies. We're really fortunate to have such a leading expert from Japan to join us today to talk about the most important questions of Japanese competitiveness at a time where it really is quite difficult to see the way forward. The seminar today is part of our special series on Japanese-US cooperation and digital governance, which is sponsored by the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies, the Mosavar Romani Center for Business and Co for Business and Government. Next week, if you would like to join us, we'll be continuing the theme of digital globalization and governance, looking at policies in East Asia, joined by a leading former trade negotiator, vice president of the Asia Society, Wendy Cutler, and Liji Liu and Stephen Weymouth, both professors at Georgetown University. And this will be an exciting chance to talk about digital globalization. Remind you of our Zoom etiquette for the session tonight. And without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and start. Uh, Professor Motohashi, if you'd like to begin your presentation. So thank you very much, uh, Christina, for your kind uh, introduction. And uh, also, uh, good night, maybe, <laughs> in uh, US Eastern time. And uh, so here is, of course, in the morning in Tokyo. So uh, I'm Kazu Motohashi, and let me start uh, my presentation, uh, sharing my slide. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> actually, uh, as uh, Christina introduced, uh, I am working on quite wide range of uh, issues of uh, economics of technological progress, uh, and uh, also, so which leads to uh, so-called competitiveness, uh, so industrial competitiveness. Uh, so of course, this is quite a uh, you know, wide, wide range of topic. So let me, uh, try to you know, skip around uh, my slide. And, and uh, because I basically I'm talking about uh, uh, so-called science economy. So which is a science is uh, basically a quite critical role uh, to, uh, to, to come up with uh, industrial innovation, which of course leads to the uh, competitiveness. And also a digital uh, you know, platform because uh, so this kind of US, uh, you know, China, I mean, uh, those are uh, two, you know, big countries. Uh, so vis-a-vis -vis in Japan, so many, you know, people is talking about, uh, you know, digital, you know, platforming, uh, which which you can see in a uh, GAFA in US, something like this. Or what 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 Japan is going to do? So so is it related to the industrial competitiveness? So there are two basically main topics uh, for today. Okay. So let me. Uh, so actually, uh, I. So for, for Japanese speakers, so it, which is in book in Japan, but uh, I published uh, my book in Nikkei about uh, almost uh, seven years ago, which is quite old one. But, but uh, here I produced, uh, kind of introduced the concept of so-called uh, science economy. Uh, and and uh, so th that will be uh, taking advantage of this uh, trend uh, should be, uh, uh, you know, uh, so-called uh, uh, Japan's, uh, I would say, way to regain or whatever, you know, keep uh, the industrial competitiveness. And, and of course, uh, I have lots of subsequent works, uh, which I put uh, 
uh, as a reference uh, at the back uh, last page of my slide, uh, as you could share with uh, yourself. Uh, and uh, so those are the contents uh, which are based on uh, for, for my uh, presentation for today. <clears throat> okay, so, so the question is because uh, this, you know, actually literally translate uh, the title of this book uh, is uh, uh, The Sun Rise Again, something like this uh, in Japan. And, and the science, of course, uh, industrial competitiveness. And, and, and the question, okay, the, my, my brief answer to, you know, uh, at the beginning of these things uh, is, of course, yes, uh, but, but uh, we need some, some you know, adjustment uh, to environment, to new environment. This is basically one you know, big topic I'm talking about today. So what is new environment? Uh, so uh, I would say that, uh, so the whole you know, uh, kind of basis of uh, innovation is shifting from uh, industrial base uh, to the science base. So, and also, you know, uh, digital platform. Uh, but, but of course, uh, after I publish uh, the book in Nikkei, so there are, you know, other complications is coming uh, outside Japan. So one is, uh, you know, COVID, uh, and and of course this uh, change uh, fundamentally our you know way of life as well as uh, the industry you know uh, setting uh, for for the for the industry or uh, you know, industry organization uh, you know, innovation you know collaboration internationally whatever and also you know U.S. China decoupling. So this is not uh, actually you know. Uh, the key topic for today, but still we have to take into account uh, those factors. And, and, and those two things uh, is uh, maybe, you know, one of the big, I would say, change uh, for C in these uh, couple of years is, uh, you, know, you know, it's kind of, uh, you know, arising nationalism movement, so which is anti, you know, says global or, you know, international. Uh, so we, which is no good. Uh, so of course, uh, how to deal with it is a very important uh, topic uh, for Japan too. So uh, at the end, I, I'll try to explain about uh, what is Japan's new industrial policy. So, so what should be. So, so actually, uh, as uh, uh, Christina introduced a little bit, uh, so I have a background. Uh, so at this moment, uh, I'm teaching at the University of Tokyo, but uh, about 20 years ago, so I, used, I was uh, the government officials at the METI, the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry. Uh, so that's why I, I'm, I'm actively engaged with uh, you know, policies by METI, as well as MEXT, which is the Ministry of Science and Technology. And, uh, but but uh, so METI was kind of famous in the 80s uh, for industrial policy. Uh, but, but this kind of industrial policy is based on an industry-based economy. But uh, so we have to define what, what will be the you know, new industrial policy at this moment. So this is my, my conclusion. Okay, so uh, as you know that uh, competitiveness uh, is, is, is kind of you know, uh, based on everything. So everything means that, uh, of course, domestic economy, you know, internationalization, corporate management, science and technology, those are all of these factors is, uh, you know, I explain about, uh, so, so this is kind of famous. Uh, IMD, so Switzerland, uh, World Competitiveness Yearbook. And, and uh, when you see that uh, the ranking of Japan uh, used to be, you know, very, you know, high. In, I, I'm sorry, and there are some mistake in, in But here is something like a 1990, 1990, 1989, 1990, 1991. It's a top in the world, so 30 years ago. Uh, but uh, so while I was working at the METI, <laughs> was, you know, it's kind of, you know, Japan was treated uh, very, very competitive in the world. But now, uh, so something like a 25 fifth position. Uh, US is keeping the position in a second, third, you know, for all over time. So which is very different. So, so and uh, so uh, why this, you know, of course, uh, you know, uh, World Competitiveness Yearbook uh, based on uh, qualitative uh, information by a questionnaire to the to, to the company, you know, corporate leaders, uh, as well as quantitative figures, statistics. Uh, so, so could be, you know, biased by, by subjective, you know, uh, kind of bias by this uh, questionnaire survey part. But but uh, 
what I actually see here is, is uh, right down. So 1990s, where Japan's competitiveness is very strong. Uh, so one of the, you know, uh, the, the items which are based on, you know, it's kind of sub items under the big, you know, uh, consolidated indicator. Uh, so items is, is something like a product quality, automation, so good uh, industry garment relationship. Those are the kind of uh, the issues which are discussed under the, you know, uh, explaining factor of industrial competitiveness. So where Japan uh, is very, very strong, uh, very strong. But after 2000, uh, this, you know, is, is kind of gone. So, so the new, you know, basis for the competitiveness is changed to international experience of employees, uh, quality of senior managers, uh, transparency of the government structure reform. So, so which, is, which is something like uh, not, uh, you know, sort of in-house domestic based competitiveness by, for example, like a Japanese automotive, you know, company to more uh, internationalized, uh, more transparent, uh, more market-based, so, so those are the kind of shift of the view from a leader, you know, global leader in a business, uh, see industrial competitiveness. So what, what is, you know, background? So, so here is uh, actually kind of long-term, you know, GDP share by country uh, about, you know, 300 years ago, there used to be China, India dominated uh, the world economy, but the uh, 1980s, so where, you know, Japan is sort of hold as a, uh, uh, very competitive, competitive. Uh, so US came and, and, and then Japan have uh, about 8% 8, 8 share of world GDP. And, and, and uh, 2008, uh, so which is, uh, is, is uh, you know, China, you know, of course, uh, rising, as well as India and, and Japan shrinks. So what is this three, you know, you know period? Uh, so what we could, you know, see the, the chain, you know, sort of, you know, underlining mechanism, which uh, change the relative share of the world economy by country. Uh, so we need to look at uh, sort of per capita GDP because uh, China, they have a 10 times population as of, as of Japan. So, so, so of course, uh, we need to see how the level of the economic growth, uh, so where, where they are developing or developed by, by you know, per capita GDP. So uh, again, in a very long time scale from something like a hundred years. So, uh, here is Japan, okay. Japan is uh, this uh, right blue. So uh, Japan basically, you know, catch up to these are the US and Europe, okay, these two. UK, Spain, US is this. Uh, catch up uh, in uh, about, uh, you know, uh, uh, 20, early 20th century. So which is, uh, you know, uh, Edo era finish and after, you know, Meiji era came, restoration came, and then, then they're catching up to the world economy, uh, to, to, to the Western economy. And now uh, the level of uh, per capita GDP is almost the same as uh, US or, or you know, European countries. And, and, and uh, here is Korea. So Korea is of course, uh, you know, it's coming later. And, and, and uh, so China, India is coming. A little bit, you know, this uh, scale is old. So I think now it's 2020. So China, of course, catch up more closely to those of, you know, Western countries. But uh, so what is, again, so what is, uh, the, you know, uh, behind uh, under this? So, so I would, you know, uh, you know present uh, this slide. So uh, for example, like, uh, as you can remember that uh, in uh, like 300 years ago, so before so-called industrial revolution uh, started uh, in UK spreading to, to the European continent and subsequently in US, uh, so before that point, uh, basically, you know, economy is on manual, so based on the human labor. So the number of so population larger, land places larger, then, then they have a more, you know, output. But, but after industrial, you know, economy, so power comes, like steam engine, electricity, whatever. Uh, so power comes, then, then per capita, you know, productivity, so labor productivity are very, you know, different. So those things which are made by one human being, can be changed by power. So, so that will uh, change uh, the kind of diversion of uh, per capita GDP. So, so the question is uh, to, you know, when uh, the country catch up to, to the new era. So, so of course, uh, so this industrial revolution started from you know, Europe, then the European countries uh, started earlier. So, so Japan uh, 
150 years after they, you know, pick up this. And then subsequently, you know, Korea or China or India are catching up. But uh, so once, uh, you know, those catching up countries like Korea or China, which are the actually cheaper, actually in a factor, factor price, what factor price is uh, basically labor cost, wage, or, you know, capital cost, then, you know, uh, <clears throat> the, the country which uh, could be, you know, caught, so which is in Japan vis-a-vis -vis China, uh, become to be a very difficult condition. And, and, and the history, you know, is when you go back, very, uh, you know, in, in an earlier period, it's old time. So same things happen to US to Japan. So Japan catching up, and, and then the US basically, you know, uh, semiconductor, uh, electrical appliance, automotive. I think they, they, they have a serious, you know, competitive pressure from Japanese company. Because Japanese company, you know, 40, 50 years ago, uh, based on a very cheap, you know, factor price, right? So, so this is what's going on in, in, in Japan. But, but uh, what happened in US after that, like, like recently, is uh, I think US is uh, sort of de-industrialized de a little bit and move on to the knowledge-based sector, pretty much. And I would say most many things are based on the science base. Science is, of course, uh, you know, uh, natural science, but, but of course, social science, what we do in economics. So uh, the, one of the, you know, uh, big things happening in the early 21st century uh, is, uh, of course, uh, IT, you know, uh, information technology, you know, revolution. Uh, and uh, so internet started late 1990s. And, and then, 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 then you should used to buy widely in a commercially. Uh, now, you know, IoT, AI, those new things is coming. Very, very different from, you know, 1990s. And uh, so biotech, uh, so human genome are decodified at the early, you know, 21st century, like 2001-2, which are based on uh, so-called genome science uh, in the pharmaceutical industry. Nanotech, of course, change a lot about, you know, material industry, material based on automotive, you know, a scene, whatever, you know, many things. Okay, so, so, so I would say US, European countries, uh, it is kind of moving to science economy already, but Japan is kind of, you know, a little bit lagging behind those things. But uh, so basically my point at the end, what is a new industrial policy is try to catch up uh, to, to this uh, science economy as, as soon as possible. So this is my, my conclusion. But anyway, so what about China? So China is really interesting because uh, China used to be catching up to Japan, but uh, as we can see that, for example, like uh, so GAFA, so uh, Google, Amazon, you know, Facebook changed the name, but anyway, so kind of old name, but uh, you know, uh, Apple, Amazon, and, and, and Microsoft. So, so those are the, so basically, you know, so-called platform economy, which are the huge corporate value based on, you know, information technology, uh, data science, maybe AI too, or biotech. So there are big, you know, biotech, uh, lots of, lots of biotech uh, also become to the very big, uh, you know, in the US or Europe. Uh, so we don't see those companies in Japan, unfortunately. Uh, but in China, so they have, they are basically catching up to Japan by industrialization and still they are doing industrialization. At the same time, they have a so-called, uh, you know, internet platform called the BAT, so which is a, a Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. Uh, there are other companies which is, has a big value, uh, on, based on the platform economy. So, so, you know, it, it's, it's kind of, I think, uh, you know, today I, I'm not, you know, I don't have enough time to talk about these things because, uh, you know, China, uh, innovation is one of uh, my, my topic in a coverage in a research area. Uh, so, but anyway, so I, I cannot talk a lot about uh, how China can be assessed vis-a-vis uh, -vis US or Japan, but anyway, so, uh, so, so it's coming, it's coming or in some sense, uh, it's very, very serious, you know, competitive, you know, uh, actually position uh, from the Japanese report point. Uh, and India is basically, they are actually basically uh, trying to move on to the industrial economy because, uh, uh, you know, Narendra Modi, you know, policy, industrial policy is, is so-called make in India, so which is more industrial base. It's kind of lagging behind. 
Okay, so what is the difference uh, between uh, the industrial economy and science economy uh, in terms of the organization of innovation? So, so uh, briefly talking about, so this is industrial economy, so, uh, so which is, uh, uh, you know, product innovation uh, and process innovation. So, so those are the, you know, basically, you know, can be achieved by efficiency in an in-house pipeline. I would say pipeline is supply chain model. So you can imagine that automotive industry and, and, and uh, so big car company like a Toyota Motors, uh, Honda Motors, uh, organize whole, whole, you know, uh, you know uh, pipeline, which is a supply chain, rigid, hierarchical, okay? And, and, and scientific knowledge is kind of input but not, you know, uh, so science is science is doing, you know, university is doing per se. And then if there are something, you know, industry can use, then they use it. So this is called a linear model. So science, technology, and innovation industry, linear model. But, but, uh, but uh, the science economy, because uh, the many things, uh, you know, is based on, uh, more scientific, I mean, scientific is, uh, I think it's a little bit definition of the science is, uh, of course, uh, science uh, is based on, a, you know, kind of kind of uh, uh, basic, uh, I would say, rules or foundation, uh, which happened in, 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 in a, you know, uh, I would say, <clears throat> in, in many places. And uh, so uh, anybody can access to this in many cases because uh, academia, so we are publishing our paper. And then, then anybody can access to these things. So it's kind of open, you know, knowledge. So here the competitiveness is coming from more, more like a trade uh, secret inside a company. So that's why in-house is very important. Uh, so company don't want to, you know, uh, don't want to, uh, your competitors to use your own technology. So company wants to, you know, try to confine their own, I would say, skills, capacity, technological resources inside. But, but here is uh, because uh, the AI, let's talk about AI. So AI based on uh, many types of uh, algorithms uh, for machine learning, deep learning, whatever. So, so most of those algorithms are publicly available. So you can use this and together with maybe data are more proprietary. Right? Then you can come up with a big solution, right? So, so it's kind of science knowledge, sometimes uh, you know, happen in academia, are used uh, to uh, so-called science innovation, which is a science-based innovation. So many university startup companies coming. University have also patent, so not just publication. So patent, the company has to pay for the license fee to, to use it. So those are the so-called science innovation. And, and the company side is uh, doing a so-called ecosystem style, so more open innovation style, to capture the new you know, uh, technological opportunity which is happening in academia as well as basic science inside the company. Okay, so, so here is, uh, so, so that's why uh, now the company is, of course, not only in Japan, Japanese company, but also in, in the world, uh, really, you know, uh, try to do, uh, to use uh, academic, uh, you know, scientific activities by, you know, university, industry, collaborations, whatever, uh, then to, 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 you know, to introduce uh, their, their, I would say, knowledge uh, embodied in, in their product services at the end. So, so, so which is uh, those, you know, uh, here is, is more interactive as compared to, to the linear model. So big difference is, uh, first thing is, uh, this is like a self-containment by, by each company. And here is more like open innovation. So you, you, you try to influence to others to come up with something big. Okay, so uh, here I, I go into uh, the use of the digital platform uh, to say a little bit about uh, what is this platform and, and ecosystem. Okay, I, I skip this things. Yeah, maybe I also skip this. Yeah, I mean, I also maybe yeah, because due to the time, Maybe I jump into the you know digital platform, you know. So uh, not only digital, because platform it should not have be, you know, must not be digital. You know, of course there are lots of lots of digital platforms, but there are not uh, you know digital platforms as well, something like a credit card industry. 
So credit card industry is, is basically, you know, uh, the credit card company like Visa, Masters, uh, actually a link of a supplier, which is uh, the shop. When you use the credit card, there is some shop side and the user side, right? So, so, so this is called a so-called two-sided market. And, and the platform is in between, so, sort of intermediary uh, to connect to, you know, uh, market. So here I, I use, uh, I think this, you know, terminology is coming from uh, you know, other scholars like Marshall Bernstein, uh, Michael Cusimano, they are MIT, US, uh, you know, people. And <clears throat> but anyway, so uh, the pro they, they call the producer and the consumer. So this is a shop for the credit card. So this is uh, ourselves, we use credit card. Okay, and, and, and here is a Visa card or Master card. But uh, let's take a case of digital economy. So I, I, I take a case of the iOS platform. So you use a, when you use a iPhone or maybe Android. Uh, so there is some you know, smartphone platform uh, organized by Apple or Google. And, and, and this platform uh, connect uh, the app producer. So you have a lot of app in a smartphone, right? So uh, Zoom too, and, and so Facebook, whatever, Twitter, uh, social media, as well as a game or whatever, many things. And uh, so, th so this is the app, right? So like a Facebook, you know, Meta company, uh, Twitter, so those are the producer. And, and consumers ours, ourselves, we use this. So uh, here, uh, there are two types of network effect. Uh, so I don't think that I have enough time to explain these things, but as you have some basic knowledge in the microeconomics, so network effect uh, is one of the very powerful, you know, uh, mechanism where the so-called competitive, you know, pricings are, are divert from social optimum price. So, so when, when network, you know, uh, economy, network effect, uh, you know, exist, then uh, you can get some scale economy, very, very scalable, you know, things. So when, when scale is big, then the value uh, actually increase more than linearly. So this is basically, you know, a network effect. Uh, so one is a direct network effect. So we, we can see that, uh, so as, as you know, um, <clears throat> many, you know, telephone company talking about. So telephone, uh, so one of the, you know, famous, kind of joke uh, in, the, in the marketing people, you know, uh, in a business society is, uh, so who is the best, you know, salesman in the world? So the answer is the, 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 the salesman who sells the first uh, telephone. Because, because, you know, there are one, only one user for the telephone. There are nobody you can call, right? So, so it's worthless. And because the, the reason why we're using telephone, I mean, we are not using a telephone not at this moment, but uh, because there are many users and we can call many people, that's why, you know, we use uh, the, you know, telephone, right? So the value of telephone or fax or whatever, email or whatever, network, so-called, is a number of user. Number of user increase, then the, the, the actually uh, um, value for the user increase. So this is a conventional direct network, but a two-sided network is a so-called indirect network effect. So which is uh, the, the producer, okay? Uh, when you, uh, you, you start up uh, your game app, let's say, then uh, you want to uh, put your app to the platform which have uh, many users, right? So of course, uh, you know, uh, of course, uh, iOS, Android are very competitive. But, but if iOS have a huge you know, user base and, and Android is a small, then the incentive to put their app is more to this bigger you know, network, right? So, so, and also consumer side, when you have lots of lots of app, then you are likely to buy it. Again, the same case as iOS, Android, uh, actually these two are competitive. But, but let's assume that, uh, you know, iOS has more you know, apps and, and Android is not, not so much. So your individual people to, to use this smartphone uh, prefer to use uh, iOS, right? So both sides. So one thing is direct, if, if direct network effect is, is, is very, you know, uh, is working. 
And but so in the indirect network effect is also what? So both you know uh, network effect is working. That's why uh, so you know when I I saw here that uh, uh, what is uh, you know biggest value you know company in the world, a little bit you know, old I'm sorry, but but still you know I think this this you know order are not very different at this moment. Apple, Alphabet, Google parent company, uh, Microsoft, right? So uh, <clears throat> why those company uh, have not a uh, big sales as compared to ExxonMobil, but why those company are valued so much, so high in the stock market? It's because uh, the investor are expecting this network effect. And this network effect uh, is kind of snowballing, right? So when you have already have this one, then those competitive position is very, very, very strong. It's very, very difficult for the newcomer to keep in, in this kind of, you know, industry. Okay, but uh, so again, so I, I told you that, uh, so in Japan, uh, we don't have something like comparable to Apple or Google or Meta or those, you know, company, unfortunately. Uh, we have a, uh, you know, line, which is Japan, but it's kind of scale is smaller. So scale is smaller, which means that uh, the value is become very, very small due to the, you know, uh, the effect of the so-called network effect. Uh, it's, it's kind of small, <clears throat> not linear, but more than linear, you know, it's a bit small. But uh, so wh why, where, you know, in China, they have, you know, BAT, which, because China is a big population. So I think they can achieve to, to this tipping point. They pass easily to the tipping point to, to you know, make this network, network effect, uh, you know, uh, available. Uh, so so that, that's why they have a very big company. They have a lots of, lots of uh, so-called, uh, you know, uh, so-called, you know, uh, so-called, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, tried, I, I tried to say that a unicorn company, you know, market, market value become very, very big. Uh, so, so, so here is, but, but in Japan, we don't have okay. So what would be the competitiveness of Japan? So, so you need to look at uh, very careful. So uh, the digital platform is not only, you know, B2B internet type, like a GAFA type uh, platform, which have both network effect, both you know direct network effect, and indirect network effect. I, I call this one as a cross side because there are two sides indirect network effect. So type one, I would say digital network platform, something like I show you like a smartphone OS, and they have both. So which is a huge, I mean they, they become to be a very very huge you know uh, value. But uh, there are other two types of network. So one is the, the, the kind of the, actually uh, the network uh, which have uh, uh, you know only cross side network. So credit card company something like this. So there are not so much direct network, right? So you don't care, you know, you don't care whether you are a friend have Visa or Master. What, what you care is just uh, you know number of the shop which accept your Visa card, right? So this is a cross side network. So this is type two. And, and uh, in terms of digital network, so one example is SAP, which is an ERP software company, but recently, uh, for example, like uh, NVIDIA, so which is a big producer for the GPI, used for the deep learning, machine learning. So, so those, you know, those uh, company uh, try to open up uh, to their kind of solution you know, provider and then make uh, the, their whole you know, set of uh, uh, solution to the user more, I would say, uh, attractive. So, so, so this is uh, you know, type two, uh, and type three is uh, in, a, in a data network. So you use uh, the size of a user. Then, then, then so for, for example, I, 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 I try to explain about uh, those, you know, uh, I mean, example as a Komatsu. Uh, Komatsu is a Japanese construction machinery company briefly uh, later. But uh, so basically what they're doing is, uh, is uh, collecting the, I mean, the data, 
by the user. So Komatsu has, a, maybe it's better to explain about this. Thing. So, so this is, I'm sorry, there are some Japanese, but anyway, uh, I mean, due to, again, so the uh, time constraints, uh, I need to, you know, uh, put it in a word. What they're doing is called a smart construction. The, what, how they can do it. So, so you can see, I mean, so for, for here, you, you see some uh, so-called so -called excavator. So like a, something like a digging the soil uh, to flatten the space or to, 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 you know, to, to the mountain, to, 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 for, for, for the construction site or whatever. So uh, basically, so they have uh, millions of uh, you know, excavator, Komatsu excavator, operated all over the world. Uh, so biggest market in China. And second one is I think it's now in India. So not so much construction activity in Japan at this moment. So they have a lot of, lot of international business in China. So what they're doing is uh, they collect all the information, how they operate uh, their individual, you know, excavator uh, by owner. So th th there is some function for the ex excavator to store their data, how operator operate, how the pressure for the digging, what is the oil gauge, what is right. So, so, you know, basically to, to track the energy efficiency for each, uh, you know, operator. And they analyze, they look at the data, they analyze, and, and, and they feedback to the solution, like a uh, kind of autonomous uh, driving function for, for, for each, you know, excavator, something like this. And, and now they are doing, they are actually, uh, you know, searching the land face by drone, and, 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 and then, then, you know, visualize, uh, 3D visualization, and also they have uh, the data for that soil, so that there is very hard, you know, soil or rock, something like this, or, you know, it's kind of soft soil, so it depends on what kind of excavator they use, it's depending on these kind of things, and then, then, then produce a construction plan, and then you input this plan to the machine, the machine, of course, you need an operator, not fully, you know, automated, but still, you know, operator, can do some sort of semi-automotive -autom you know, function, and, and then, then, then you know, uh, make whole things is very efficient. Okay, so, so these things is basically, they, use, they need a lot of, lot of data. So big I'm data. sorry to interrupt. To you you could sure interrupt. That, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm, 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 yeah. I know, I know that. Sure, okay. <laughs> sure. So, 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 okay, so one, two, three, okay. Then, uh, so here is, uh, you know, uh, one. Uh, so uh, basically, this is direct network effect, yes, no. And, and cross side network is yes, no. And both yes is type one, like, like in internet iOS. And, and only cross network is type two, produce ecosystem I call. And, and, and then, then only, you know, uh, in a digital protocol sense that uh, type three. So this is so-called, I would say, IoT data, this one, which is command one. And Japan is very strong here. And, and the question is uh, whether this kind of style could achieve to uh, indirect network effect to become to the type one. And, and, and those are the, basically the point where so IoT strategy in Japan is doing. So, so uh, of course, uh, there are competitors in China or US, but I would say that, uh, so for type one, so Japan is lacking behind China, US, uh, but, uh, you know, type three are really, really, you know, the competitor at this moment. So this is a point uh, where I would like to say at the end. Right. Right. Maybe I need to skip around a little bit. So finally, so I need to, I, I will talk about, so I, I cover the science-based uh, economy and, and then, you know, the, as a one of the example, you know, digital, you know, things, like a digital platform things. And, and finally, I'll talk about a little bit about uh, difference, kind of institutional difference uh, of uh, Japan and the US, uh, potentially in China too. So, so, uh, so Japan is, the, the reason why, so Japan are very competitive in, in, a, in the automotive industry is so-called uh, those, you know, big company, you know, uh, university, those are, uh, it's kind of, you know, business to business relationship is very stable. And, and, and uh, not very dynamic uh, as compared to like a Silicon Valley model. Of course, I'm, I'm not talking about the US model, but uh, when you go to particularly for, for the you know, Silicon Valley, I think they are more dynamic. 
Uh, so those, you know, uh, big, you know, internet platform is coming out of this, a well, disruptive condition. So Japan is more strong in a continuous condition. And those are, the, uh, you know, addressed by variety of capitalism, you know, uh, political scientists, Holman Soskis, about uh, LME, so it's a liberal market economy versus coordinated market economies. So uh, at the end, uh, so institutional, uh, comparative institutional advantage for the innovation type. So something like in case of Japan, so uh, which, which is a coordinated market economy, which is a non-market mechanism for the institution to business transaction, are strong for incremental innovation as, as compared to disruptive innovation. But uh, the question is, uh, is uh, not, you know, uh, at this moment, uh, as I talk about ecosystem, is in between market and pipeline. Pipeline is coordinated or in-house or strict, you know, pipe, you know, so-called supply chain in between. Because, because, uh, because uh, you know, the market-based or disruptive innovation is basically, oh, it, many things are dealt in, in the market mechanism, price, demand, supply, price. But uh, the ecosystem is you need to influence to others. You need to have sort of close relationship with others, not only by yourself, not control totally, but still in between, right? So, so the, my actually sense is uh, US is coming from market side, Japan is coming from more, you know, non-market size, and, and Asia is in between. So, 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 the, so the question for Japan to, to achieve to, to this, uh, you know, uh, I would say characteristic of science economy as an ecosystem is from, from this side, but, 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 uh, but uh, you know, liberalize. Uh, they, they are more strong, I would say, supply relationship, what, more, more capturing more opportunity for the IoT, so digital platform, something like this of the Komatsu case. So, so those are the actually point. Uh, so this is basically what I'm talking here, like uh, institutional convergence have to be achieved in science economy digital platform era. And particularly for this, uh, you know, IoT system is uh, basically integration hardware, which is, which is very important for the incremental innovation and also software, which is a radical innovation. So maybe, uh, again, as you know that, uh, so US, Japan, uh, I'm sorry, US uh, and China, is not now kind of heated you know, tension in a high tech era, area. Uh, so, so of course, uh, Japan. What is uh, you know to regain Japan's competitiveness in, in a, you know in this uh, world you know geopolitics uh, movement? Is uh, this is my my last slide? <laughs> okay. So so here is a uh, so called science economy. So science economy, again here is science find, finding. And then this science finding leads to uh, university patent startup, so-called science innovation is taking place. And the business is uh, trying to come up with some ecosystem. Sometimes they use the, the platforming, they use some platform as a keystone, let's say, a player. And then go, go to the new solution, okay? So, so uh, the, the, the one of the actually things I would like to you know convey here is because uh, the actually U.S. and uh, you know China is so called uh, you know I mean decoupling in particular in the high tech you know area and, and also uh, also influence to, to the academia right so uh, so you know uh, when you know U.S. Uh, scholars have some sensitive you know field of technology and they are kind of restricted they are working together with Chinese you know. US is not talking about China, but, but basically implicitly, you know, targeting to China to restrict, uh, you know, so-called so uh, collaborations. Of course, uh, export investment restrictions is applied. And, and Japan is also considering those type of legislation, so-called economic security law. But uh, I would say that, uh, so for this academia, basically science, scientific funding part is basically should be free. To be free. Uh, maybe I, 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 why you know I, I don't I don't think I have enough time to talk about. I, I'll try. I mean, if there are some questions later, I'll, I'll try to answer to that. 
And, but innovation is coming at this uh, US uh, UI collaboration high tech startup phase. So here, maybe you have to be careful a little bit. So some of the, you know, uh, things, but, but uh, so basically international, international, you know, internationalization is very, very important from Japanese viewpoint because uh, Japan, you know, uh, relative economic size is shrinking. So, so of course, but, but, uh, but there, are, there are some very, very competitive, you know, uh, something like a commerce style, type three digital platform, very competitive. So here, uh, of course, uh, it's, really, it's related to the data governance. Right, so uh, so Japan, for example, like uh, for this, uh, so Komatsu is something like in a business uh, innovation phase is, uh, so uh, as you know that uh, free data flow with trust uh, initiative by Japanese government uh, introduced in, a, in a, I think two years ago, uh, summit, G7 summit in Osaka. So, so here, but, but the trust is very important because uh, there, there are some, you know, uh, so, so the proprietary, you know, data, uh, there are some, you know, some very sort of, uh, you know, uh, enforcement by, by Chinese government. For example, like when Japanese company operate in China, you have to disclose their data to the Japanese government, Chinese government. Also. So, so, so those are the sort of, you know, uh, things which we have to be, be careful about. Uh, maybe international regime by WTO, something like that. Okay, so that's all uh, from me. And then, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Jumping around a little bit, I hope that that will help you to understand what is a you know, uh, new industrial policy in Japan. Thank you. Great. Thank you for such a comprehensive overview of how social institutions from universities to government interact with firms' ability to innovate. And really interesting to see the way this is changing in the midst of new technology and network effects. Thank you very much. This is really going to lead to some questions and I'm going to start off with our first question from Program of US-Japan Relations Associate, Mr. Shinichi Kijima, who is an associate doing research on support systems and networks for small and medium-sized enterprises while he's here with us at Harvard. And back in Japan, he works for the Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry. Mr. Kijima, would you like to go ahead with your question? Um, yes, uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, uh, I really enjoyed your lecture and learned a lot. Um, I have a question about the influence of this pandemic on innovation. Uh, I believe that uh, importance of uh, Kotozukuri and uh, Komatsu Komatrak strategy has been focused on for the past 10 years uh, because Japanese companies have been slow to transform themselves. So in this context, how could this pandemic affect innovation in Japan? So should I answer now? Yes, please go ahead. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So uh, I didn't cover, you know, uh, very much about uh, pandemic uh, impact. Uh, I, yeah, so, uh, right. So international, particularly for the, of course, uh, the human mobility internationally are uh, actually quite restricted uh, very much. Uh, so I mean, for, for these two years. So what would be, I think this is the main, you know, uh, I think impact uh, for, but of course, uh, only in a, in a domestic, you know, face-to-face, uh, -face, uh, you know, conversation uh, cannot be, you know, achieved. So basically those, those you know, meeting inside a big company still in the online, many, many places. So, so here, this is a point I, I'm actually working at this moment about, you know, but, but this is very micro, you know, we need to have some micro you know, understanding about so the role of face-to-face -face communication in, in innovation, right? Uh, <clears throat> my, my, I think my sense is, uh, my sense is, uh, I, I, I would say that, uh, you know, uh, even, of course, uh, you need to have uh, uh, more, you know, uh, intimate uh, so-called face-to-face. Uh, -face. Uh, I think there are many, many nuances you cannot convey by online. But, uh, but uh, for, for in case of Japan, so Japan is kind of, uh, you know, so-called uh, uh, lagging behind in a, in a digital transformation. So use of IT for the business. So, so I, I see uh, this uh, pandemic have a kind of uh, opportunity 
for the Japanese company because, because most people are enforced to, to do online, right? Instead of face to face. So, so, so I think this would be, you know, uh, make more efficiency in, in, in a kind of innovation activity in Japan. So this is my sort of, you know, sense. Uh, so still, I, I'm working on this subject about my micro, you know, foundation, communication and innovation at this moment. Yeah. Great. Next, okay. I'd like to call on our associate, Kristen Vicasey, a professor at the University of Maine. Hi. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for your really interesting talk. Um, I wrote my question in the chat, so I'll just I'll just read it out as well. Um, so in your in your conclusions, you were talking about things like the data concern, uh, security concerns with China, um, you know, IPR issues and things like this. But Japan is also, of course, competing with its its allies, and Japanese companies are competing with American companies and Australian companies, South Korean companies. Um, uh, as, uh, so what are some concerns that you might have or some of these cutting edge companies might have about competitiveness and innovation with regard to some of the things that are proposed in the new economic security legislation? And how do you see Japan's innovation path moving forward to kind of balance those, those different concerns? Okay, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so... Uh, yeah, of course, of course. Uh, so, of course, we, we, ha we have to worry about uh, not only uh, China, but, but of course, neighboring countries, uh, particularly, you know, uh, <clears throat> I'll say, I'll say neighboring countries like Korea, uh, Australia, US, I, I don't know, I've never thought about very much about uh, Australia, but, but for example, when I talk about the US, so, okay, let's, let's, let's talk about, uh, so, which we have to care more, I mean, whether, you know, between US and China. I, I would say China more. Because, uh, as, as I can, because, uh, you know, I didn't know what to do. So I just, maybe you, you may forgot, <laughs> but at the beginning of, uh, you know, my presentation, I, I explained something like this. So, so it seems to me that, uh, that of course, uh, in US, uh, there is a very good, uh, big manufacturing company, like a G, GE. So GE is a kind of big, you know, good user for the IoT, which is have a competitor to, you know, some of Japanese companies. Uh, but uh, but uh, I, I think that in terms of the monozukuri, so-called, uh, you know, manufacturing, you know, capability thing, sense, uh, China is catching up pretty much, you know, uh, rapidly, and they have a. Uh, of course, and also lots of lots of production sites in China. So they are very good positioning, uh, combining this uh, manufacturing competitiveness with digital, you know, I'll say, internet, so so called technology. So 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 in terms of uh, so as I talked to you that uh, there are three types of uh, you know data net platforms. So type one is kind of key. So from type one to the type one, uh, excuse me, type three to the type one is a key for the Japanese company to do this. GE tried, but they, they failed so far, so far, but still they are struggling to do this. So, uh, but many, you know, Chinese company is trying to do it. But, but, but still, you know, uh, so Japan is kind of, uh, you know, they, they are trying to, you know, catch up with Japanese company in terms of management sense. So, so in this sense, uh, so relative, you know, competitiveness, uh, you know, challenge, uh, I, I think uh, we have to be much, much care about uh, what China is doing. So US, of course, uh, lots of competitors over there, but uh, they are also uh, moving toward a uh, similar way to that of Japan and kind of, uh, you know, a long history about uh, the market position on the US company and Japanese company uh, is sort of a division of labor, uh, actually we can see already. That's my answer. And following on this theme, I'd like to ask a last question myself, is taking the prerogative of moderator. How does the 5G and most recently 6G mm -hmm. telecommunication infrastructure question relate to network effects? Are mm -hmm. there 
spillovers that are important? And do you see this as motivating the government effort, the promotion consortium that's trying to help Japan jump into 6G technology, bringing together a lot of companies for collaboration? Is there a special reason for government support when there are going to be externalities for downstream industry? And how would that relate to your typology of network effects? Okay, uh, <clears throat> so I, I think this is very, you know, a good uh, question in a sense that, uh, uh, so there are, I think we need to we need to actually uh, distinguish uh, between 5G case and 6G case. In the sense that 5G is already you know uh, telecommunication standard are setting up in a phase of uh, you know uh, utilization. So so all tele telecom carrier, mobile telecom carrier, all, all already using 5G, right? So so here it's more like uh, industry based. And 6G is still, you know, uh, they, they are on, on a stage of, so beyond 5G, sort of 6G. It is on a, actually a, a stage of uh, uh, developing something new. So nobody knows about this at this moment. Okay. So for, for, the, for the 5G, so network effect, that's why the network effect, effect is coming from industrial base. So production, sales. So for, for example, like a, Clean network effect uh, uh, act like the US, which kind of kick out, uh, you know, Huawei, is because uh, the the so this is sort of a traditional, you know, uh, industrial policy uh, as an industry base, and of course a uh, network effect prevail. So if there are lots of lots of you know uh, Huawei you know, products, then that will be beneficial for, for this Chinese company. But but uh, it's kind of that directly affected to you know, uh, the, the, the industry. So, so which is very, you know, uh, similar to what happened uh, in the 1980s, where, where you know, when the, the US, uh, so Japan, US is kind of complaining about uh, Japanese, you know, automobile uh, industry or semiconductor industry uh, to dumping the, the products and, and, and uh, unfair, you know, uh, their actually marketing activity in the US. So, so, so Japanese company, you know, uh, you know introduced self so-called uh, restaurant for export, right? So, so, so it's kind of, so 5G, what going on 5G is quite, you know, industry, you know, level, you know, a factor. Of course, of course it is effective in a sense that uh, relative, you know, industrial output by country sense. So US to China, whatever, but, 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 but that will damage uh, to the economic efficiency in the industry overall. Okay. So 6G is a uh, more innovation technological development side. Is uh, so here is uh, more like uh, so uh, I, I think like you can fit it to uh, this uh, here. I'm sorry. Uh, the last slide which I so because, because our technology is not set it up, industry is not set it up. So here is a stage of, uh, you know, it's more science side, not completely in the industry side. So, so you have to be careful about, uh, so the, to what extent, uh, which, you know, country is coming to international standard or not. Very much. Yeah, that's my answer. Well, I hope you will be advising the government as they try to navigate that line between <laughs> how open uh, the competition and collaboration should be and how quickly it can be shared. Um, sure. Thank you so much for sharing your research with us. This is really quite interesting and I appreciate your presentation. I'm sorry that we can't stay longer, but it's nine o'clock and we have to call a close to the event. So I'd like to thank you, thank our participants for joining us. Thank you very much for listening and uh, yeah, coordination.